unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant Tamasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Beshev. Why do rising powers on the global stage sometimes challenge an international order that enables their growth, yet at other times support an order that constrains them? This is the core question motivating a big new book on international order by political scientist Rohan Mukherjee. The book is titled Ascending Order, Rising Powers and the Politics of Status in International Institutions. It's a comprehensive study of conflict and cooperation as new powers join the global arena. The book focuses on how international institutions shape the choices of rising states as they pursue equal status with already established powers. Rohan is an assistant professor of international relations at the LSE, the London School of Economics and Political Science. And to talk more about his book, Rohan joins me today from his home in London. Rohan, congrats on the book and thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Rohan. Thank you very much for having me on the show. So your book starts out with what I thought was a, a pretty provocative statement. And I just want to quote from the opening pages. You write that China's cooperative behavior in the post-Cold War order is puzzling for the bulk of international relations scholarship. Because there is no evidence that China and other rising powers, you add, are preparing an assault on the liberal international order, end quote. Now, I had to read that twice because this runs contrary to a lot of the commentary and analysis we hear in Washington, right, where we, we read about a China that is that is consumed with how they want to you know, upend the liberal international system. Tell us what they've gotten wrong. Thanks. Yeah, that's a really interesting question and, and a good way to start this conversation. So I think, um, first of all, uh, what that sort of, I guess, slightly provocative framing is saying is that we need to have a more nuanced view on China's approach to the international order. I think at this point, the debate is very much caught in binaries. Um, and there are some people uh, who are sort of calling for more nuance, but they're typically not necessarily sitting in Washington or have, have the kind of access that we think they do. Um, so what I'm what I'm trying to argue there is you need to separate China's pursuit of its interests uh, within the order, right, within the international order, from China's assessment of the order itself. And the, what I basically am trying to say is China sees great value in the international order and therefore I think would like to control it or at least have a much greater say in it, but it doesn't want to necessarily get rid of it or replace it with something else entirely. And I think the evidence for that is that you know China is a fairly a rational country, and the, the order has benefited China in many major ways. You know, China is a permanent veto-wielding member of the UN Security Council. Uh, the spread of nuclear weapons has been controlled by treaties like the NPT. Uh, in you know, in the economic realm, China's trade boomed after joining the WTO. Uh, it has benefited significantly from from World Bank development financing. So we see China cooperating in in various areas uh, of the international order, like the WTO, where it has largely followed rules. Uh, and adhere to rulings in, dis in WTO disputes. It up it's upheld the NPT mostly uh, and, and participated in six-party talks with North Korea and so on. The, the areas where China does come up against the international order, I think, are, are just the areas where many other countries do. China is not that different from the U.S., which frequently disregards and undermines international rules and institutions while still basically valuing international cooperation. And I think that's the core thing to understand here. China is not like Russia. Right? Russia has no qualms about destroying or damaging the same rules and institutions because Russia has not benefited from that post-Cold post War order as much as China has. Russia has gotten much weaker and less influential, which is the opposite for China. Right? So, so China's cooperation is puzzling for IR scholars or for analysts because many analysts have convinced themselves that China is not cooperative, uh, that it doesn't cooperate. Uh, frankly, I mean, a world in which China was actually challenging the international order would be much worse than the world that we live in. So I think there's a danger also of creating a self-fulfilling prophecy by constantly acting as if China is out to destroy the current system. And so it's just a sort of call for a more measured approach. So this is a nice segue to sort of, you know, talking about the conventional wisdom kind of in IR and I think in a lot of kind of policy conversations. Uh, you know, if you think about kind of power shifts in the international order, we talk a lot about revisionism, right? And, and the basic intuition there is, you know, you have a set of rising powers and all of them have some revisionist intentions, right? In other words, they don't accept the status quo international order. They want to change it in some fundamental way. Tell us a little bit uh, about the intellectual heritage of this way of thinking before we kind of get into, you know, why it's wrong in places. Yeah, I mean, the conventional view is, is that, you know, rising powers as they rise will automatically seek to overthrow the international order. 
uh, which they, you know, one can think of the international order as the rules and institutions that great powers design to manage international cooperation and, and conflict. Um, and so, you know, it's assumed that these rules and institutions are purely designed by the great powers for their own benefit, and that a rising power will find them increasingly constraining and will therefore challenge the system whenever it's ready or able to do so. And I think this is based on three assumptions that can very well be challenged. The first assumption is that great powers are purely self-centered and only build institutions to benefit themselves. Um, the second is that rising powers are naturally dissatisfied, right? That, they, uh, it, that the status quo doesn't allow them to prosper. And, and third is that nothing short of full change, a full change of system will satisfy the rising power. And I think all of these are, are, are both logically and empirically, I think, unsound assumptions. I think that if I'm a great power, I want to design an order that lasts. And, and for, for that, I need to design something that benefits not only me, but other countries as well. And in many, many areas such as trade uh, or other economic areas, it is only by benefiting other countries that I can benefit myself. And so you see this in many international orders uh, since the early 19th century, that, that countries don't just, great powers don't decide things just for themselves. Um, rising powers, and the, the second assumption right on China, I mean, uh, as I just mentioned earlier, China, rising powers do benefit from an international order, and we can see that in the case of China. And unless their great powers are explicitly trying to throttle their rise somehow, there isn't a necessarily a reason for them to be to be dissatisfied, right? Especially because they're getting wealthier within the system. They're actually rising faster than everybody else, so they're doing better. And so it's it's really uh, not the case that they are dissatisfied per se, or that they should be. And finally, even if they are dissatisfied, it's not the case that they have to seek a fundamental overhaul of the entire system, right? They could very well cooperate with with what they could want to cooperate with what works. They might want to reform what doesn't, and they might want to throw out what's unfixable. And you see that with China. Right? China has a, has, has a varied approach to the international order. If you take the UN Security Council, it's doing one thing. If you take international financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, it's doing one thing. Or if you take human rights standards uh, and democracy promotion, it's, it's doing something else, right? So there is no one singular sense in which China either embraces or opposes the international order. Could I just push you on this a little bit, Rohan? I mean, uh, help us think about the difference among rising powers, right? So, I mean, we've talked a lot about China, but what if you insert India into the mix, right? I mean, India is a democracy. India speaks uh, very fulsomely about the liberal international order and, and you know, partnership with the West and so on and so forth. It's a member of most of these institutions. Um, but it too seems to have a lot of grievances, right? It talks about the need to have a greater voice for developing countries, the IMF and the World Bank. It talks about the need to have fairer rules of the WTO, right? It talks about uh, the need to 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 include uh, voices of 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 the of the countries of the developing world uh, in in climate negotiations, like the ones that are happening right now this week. So so are China and India all that different in 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 how they look at these things? Yes, this is a really unpopular thing to say these days, but I actually think that China and India share a lot in common with regard to their view of the international order. Um, and, and I've written about this elsewhere as well. I do think that both countries feel that this is not an order that they built. Uh, it's not an order that recognizes them as equal partners of those who actually run the show, which is the U.S. and its allies. Um, and so in that regard, membership is only the first step. I think uh, the nature of rules and how rules operate within these institutions also matter. Who gets counted as a member of the inner circle that is, is seen as the leadership of that institution also matters. And in all these cases, uh, I mean, obviously there are differences. China is already a permanent veto-wielding member of the UN Security Council. India isn't. And so a lot of India's diplomatic energy is focused on, on that. So when, when uh, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar talks about uh, reformed multilateralism, a big emphasis is you know, UN Security Council expansion for India. Uh, but in other areas, IMF, World Bank, they're actually saying the same thing. They want greater voting rights in line with their economic, their growing economic power. And the U.S. and, and other countries have sort of got a lock on, on influence within these institutions. I mean, if you look at who is the, uh, the, the director of the IMF, it's never been a non-European, right? The president of the World Bank has never been a non-American. Um, and and, and the, the president of the Asian Development Bank has never been a non-Japanese person. And so India and China look at these institutions and see them as fundamentally exclusive, exclusionary. Um, and so you get, you know, different reactions, but the, the complaint is the same. So your book uh, overall kind of asks and answers two fundamental questions, right? Number one, why might a rising power challenge the very international order that's enabled its rise, right? That's the kind of question we've been talking about. And number two, why might a rising power accept 
a disadvantage, uh, disadvantageous international order when it would be less costly to challenge or disregard it, right? And to kind of tackle both of those questions, you present a new theory of rising powers called IST or institutional status theory. Uh, in layperson's terms, if you could, you know, how do you explain what IST is and, and how is it an, a, an improvement on the prevailing wisdom? Yes. So asking an academic to speak in layperson's terms, it's very hard to <laughs> it's, it's, it's a tall order, I know. Yeah, uh, but I will, I will do my best. So I think, the, first of all, I think the mainstream view is, on rising powers is that they care about primarily security and economics, right? Material things. Uh, and so this view assumes that most of the contestation between rising powers and great powers goes on in the realm of security competition and economic competition. And you see that in the way people write about China, US, and so on. But institutional status theory, what I'm arguing, argues firstly that rising powers care about other things as well, right? Chief among them being their status in the international order. So we can think of the order as a hierarchy at the top of which are the great powers, both because they are the most powerful, but also because they are most recognized as legitimate leaders of the international order. And the rising powers want to be recognized symbolically, at least, as equals of these countries. They don't yet have the same level of power, but they want that symbolic equality. And the way to get that is in international institutions, which are very public, visible forums in which these countries can portray themselves and be recognized as important actors. And so the, the challenge, of course, is that these institutions are not always designed to be open or fair to those who are not in the inner circle, uh, you know, the great powers, essentially. Uh, so, you know, they still produce benefits, but they don't treat all countries equally. And so the theory predicts that in the moments when these institutions change to become fairer and more open, rising powers will be, will be more cooperative because cooperation is the most efficient way to gain status in that setting, right? So the classic example is China and the UN Security Council. It is recognized as an equal actor, a major actor, and so it cooperates often in that domain. On the contrary, if an institution becomes relatively unfair or closed, uh, rising powers will tend to protest that institution and try to undermine it or create new institutions and so on. And you can think of China setting up the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank as an alternative to the World Bank as one example of that, right? Not getting your recognition in these IFIs leads you to kind of go in a different direction. So institutional openness and fairness are the two things that I focus on as the factors that that matter in this situation. So let me just double down on this for a second, because your, your theory basically says, you know, under certain specified conditions, rising powers can and will sacrifice their material interests for the sake of essentially being a part of the great power club, right? Being Being top dogs. But their decision making and in, in, in how they approach that is going to be premised essentially on two things, right? Number one, institutional openness, and number two, procedural fairness, right? Just tell us a little bit more about what these are. How are they distinct, right, from one another? Yeah, so institutional openness is the degree to which um, there is a clear pathway for any particular country, in this case, the rising power, uh, to join the leadership of that institution, right? So are there clear rules about who gets to become leader? if they meet certain criteria and so on, or are there sort of more nebulous rules, in, in, in which case it's perhaps more at the discretion of other powers. Uh, if there are no rules, then it's actually quite easy. You kind of stake your claim and so on. Um, or if there are rigid rules that say, look, you know, you, you for example, the UN Security Council has this, you know, uh, the, the UN Charter says there are five, five great powers. They are recognized as such. Only they shall have the veto and so on. It's very hard for new countries to break into that, even though India, Brazil, and others have been trying. Um, the other, the other question is procedural fairness, where it's a question of whether institutional rules are unbiased and consistent in how they treat the rising power relative to the great power. So are they treated in the same way, or are there exceptions being made for the great powers that are not given to the rising powers, and so on? And so uh, there it's a matter of the application of rules rather than necessarily who gets to count as a leader. So in that sense, these are two different things in that you can be within the inner circle and yet not be treated as an equal, right? Or you can the, the 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 great powers can be, treat you very well and equally, but you will never actually be within the key decision making circle, right? They can be consultative; they can ask you your opinion when they're making decisions, but you don't actually get membership of the club. So, so these are in a sense independent things. You know what I like about this book, Rohan, is that you focus on status, right? Which is this thing that really matters, but I think sometimes social scientists have a hard time talking about it because it, it can feel somewhat uh, kind of amorphous, right? Um, but the focus on it is very interesting because it mirrors something I think we're seeing in comparative politics around the world, right? If you think about Donald Trump, 
Narendra Modi, Viktor Orban, right? They're all motivated in large measure by elevating status concerns on the part of one group or another, right? And that's part of, of how they mobilize. Now, you're talking about the international domain, obviously, which is quite different. But you note that, you know, if you go down the path of neglecting the status concerns of rising powers, this can lead international institutions to sometimes inadvertently, not on purpose, undermine their own objectives, right? Sometimes ending uh, with, with disastrous consequences. What's an example of, of how this might play out uh, in, a, in, a, in an adverse way? So the clearest example in my mind, and which is one of the cases in the book, is actually not necessarily to do with India, but with, to do with Japan between the two world wars. And I, you know, I mean, there was a naval treaty then uh, in 1922 that sort of Britain and the, and the U.S. Uh, signed with Japan, which was to reduce the construction of battleships, right? And 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 again, this was in, in material terms a very good thing because it helped all the economies of the time coming out of the First World War, which ended in 1918. It helped them to kind of cut back on military spending, even though they were really concerned about each other's militaries and so on. But the treaty had this one one provision that Japan could only construct future warships at 60 percent of the level of the U.S. and Britain, right? And Japan couldn't anyway construct at 100%, but they really wanted the 100% as a symbolic goal, right? They wanted to be considered equals, but the U.S. and Britain insisted, and they did not give them that, that equality. And, and so the major sort of factions emerged in the Japanese Navy that strongly resented this fact, right? And subsequently, the U.S. passed the infamous sort of 1924 Immigration Act, which restricted Japanese immigration to America on racial grounds. And so Japanese leaders and the public took both these facts together and realized that this international order would remain forever closed to them right, and, and forever treat them unfairly in naval terms and never let them become a great power. And so it strengthened the hands of those who were emerging at this time in the 1920s in Japanese politics who are arguing against cooperation with the West and, in fact, that Japan should expect a war with America eventually. right? And so you see that in the 1930s. By 1930, Japan withdraws from this treaty and this system and the whole thing collapses. And so this thing that was designed to essentially reduce warship construction between these countries and create peace and economic prosperity does the opposite, right? It actually has the opposite effect because it doesn't take into account Japan's status aspirations. Now, you can imagine put India in that position today, right? And you can see things are going well between the U.S. and India, but tomorrow, you know, and you can already see in Indian domestic politics this sort of growing resentment of, you know, how India is treated in international institutions, international order, India's place in the world, always sort of second tier and so on. Uh, it's not inconceivable that in the future things may get worse, right, in India-U.S. relations. Right now, they're very good, in my opinion. But that's one of the sort of examples in the book, at least, that immediately springs to mind uh, of this case. Hey, Grant the Marshall listeners. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Putting this show together each week is a labor of love, but it takes a lot of work to put out a great show every week. If you'd like to support the work we do at Grant Masha, please visit ceip.org slash donate. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcasting platform, so you'll be the first to know when a new episode rolls out. So I want to get it a bit into the cases, right? So you mentioned uh, the book looks at three historical cases. So there's the Japanese case that you talk about, which took place between you know, the interwar period. There's a case involving the United States and the maritime laws of war in the mid-19th century. And then there's an India case, which is the one I want to focus on, which really looks at nuclear non-proliferation during the Cold War. Um, you write that the NPT, or the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, is one of the few examples of successful multilateral cooperation during the Cold War. But at the same time, India is just one of four countries, right? You have Pakistan, Israel, South Sudan, and India, who have never signed the accord. Um, before we kind of get into the nitty gritty, give us a bit of context. You know, why was India's decision to remain outside of this major international treaty so consequential? Yes, it was consequential largely because this was the, this was one of the few areas in the sort of Cold War international order that the U.S. and the Soviet Union, who were otherwise competing across the world and in different countries on different military and economic domains, uh, actually were able to agree. Right? The, the, the two superpowers are able to agree that other countries or new countries should not be able to become nuclear powers. Um, and, what, and that meant that, you know, in a sense, those who already had them should be, the, the, the number of nuclear powers should be frozen at that number, and the new entrance to the nuclear club had to be blocked somehow. And so the NPT was the institutional expression of that. It's, it's one of the main pillars of the international order during the Cold War, uh, and both superpowers agreed that 
uh, they would essentially, you know, there would be this two-tier system where those who already had nuclear weapons would be called nuclear weapon states, and those who did not would be allowed to pursue civilian nuclear energy, but would be sort of stopped from building nuclear weapons. Right? There's a commitment to not transferring nuclear te uh, weapons technology to these countries. And so India challenging this sort of challenge, the one area in which there was the greatest cooperation between the superpowers during the, during the Cold War, um, it, it was a direct challenge, you know, um, and, and, and the U.S. in particular had to spend a great amount. And when I say challenge, I mean, in, you know, I'm talking about India's nuclear test in 1974, which was sort of a challenge to the treaty in a sense. And the U.S. had to spend a great amount of time, money and diplomatic energy to make sure that India, a repeat of India did not happen, right? And so they set up the nuclear suppliers group to control international commerce. They built all these in diplomatic infrastructure to make sure that future countries could not do what India did, which was divert civilian nuclear technology to make the bomb. Um, it's also consequential because it set off this reaction where uh, Pakistan used it as a justification for its own nuclear program, right? So it made security much worse in the South Asian uh, region. Um, and, and beyond the Cold, throughout the Cold War and even beyond it, uh, India also maintained a fairly constant position of trying to delegitimize the NPT and other aspects of the international nuclear order. And so it remained a major sticking point, so much so that, you know, the, the growth of India-U.S. relations in the 21st century was premised on the conclusion of the nuclear deal, which was essentially something that brought India out of the cold and into the international order as a sort of de facto and responsible nuclear power. That was the, without that, I don't think we would be where we are today in terms of uh, India-U.S. relations, but also India's place in the international order. It was a major sticking point from both sides. You know, what I found so interesting about the India case is that its response to the nuclear order was neither simple nor straightforward, right? In a, maybe in a classic Indian sense, right? And there were sort of these multiple phases in its approach. And I'm wondering if you kind of walk us through those, right? So first, you have a situation in which India is lobbying very hard to expand this elite club of nations involved in setting up the IAEA or the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, but then you move to a second phase. India is adopting, you know, a much more cooperative stance with the international order, but then eventually it kind of reverses course, right? It challenges the existing order. To walk us through, you know, what was shaping its thinking, uh, you know, over that, you know, multi-decade period? Yeah, so the story sort of starts um, in the mid-1950s when um, the U.S. Just proposes the creation of this International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, and, and the goal is to essentially help uh, quote unquote help uh, you know non nuclear countries with nuclear energy resources while sort of trying to find a way to stop the spread of nuclear weapons technology and so uh, so Homi Bhabha leads the negotiations India's sort of chief atomic scientist major figure in India's scientific establishment Krishna Menon is at the UN negotiating this and Nehru is kind of supervising both of them from Delhi and they all worry about the emergence of an unfair institution that would monopolize uranium and other nuclear technologies in a way that would benefit those who already had nuclear weapons, the have powers, as they call them. India was seen, and they saw India as themselves as a have-not power. Um, and so they objected strenuously in diplomatic forums to this sort of emerging IAEA. And the U.S., you know, actually relented, and, and they changed their approach, and the U.S. and its allies made the IAEA more inclusive. They allowed for a geographic quota of sorts to decide the composition of the Board of Governors of the IAEA, which essentially gave India a de facto permanent position at the top of the agency, along with other countries. And so by the early 1960s, Indian leaders were quite satisfied, actually, with their status in the international order. Going into the 60s, they felt that India was a key player. It was at the negotiating table. But by the mid-1960s, it becomes pretty clear that the superpowers were not interested or not serious about disarmament, and instead only wanted to control the spread of nuclear weapons. And so they, they introduced drafts of the NPT, uh, both these superpowers, that, that showed that there was no commitment to stopping what was known then as horizontal, uh, sorry, stopping vertical proliferation, i.e. proliferation to, uh, to countries that already had nuclear weapons. It was all about stopping horizontal pro proliferation, preventing new nuclear powers from emerging. So India begins, began to object to this draft treaty as being discriminatory and unequal because it created a two-tier system of countries. So it was it's literally written even to this day in the NPT that if you did not have nuclear weapons on January 1st, 1967, you are officially not a nuclear weapons state. Um, but despite India's objections, the treaty gained enough support, it was, uh, and it came into force in 1970. At this point, India's approach to the order really changes, um, the third phase, sort of, it, it hardens. And there's a sense in New Delhi among government officials and elites, intellectuals, journalists, and others, that India needed to demonstrate its scientific capability, which was ultimately 
the source of India's status equality with the great powers. So India's all, position had always been that it was a scientifically superior country that could build nuclear weapons but chose not to. And this gave India a lot of status in the international order. But the NPT deflated that status and put India into the second class category. And more importantly, China and France, who refused to sign the NPT until 1992, were still recognized by the treaty with the January 1967 clause as nuclear weapon states. But India, which had scrupulously followed the rules and, and not pursued the nuclear bomb, was denied. Right? So this was really a big demotion for India. It was seen as a sort of closing off India's options, a deeply unfair order that, that rewarded those who, who pursued you know, these violent weapons. Um, and so India, at that point, one can see the 1974 test as a demonstration of India's status uh, uh, equality with the great powers. Uh, there's obviously, given the secretive nature of this decision, there isn't direct documentary evidence about this. But there's plenty of elite commentary around this time, some discussion government documents from the 1970s, and retrospective reflection, re reflections from people like Raja Ramanna, the scientists who were involved in this decision, uh, to suggest that this was a demonstration. And I think the biggest evidence of that is that there were no moves made by India after that to build nuclear weapons or to even have, grow the nuclear program. After that one test in 74, they stopped. And they only really start weaponizing their capability in 1989 when it emerges, definitively emerges that Pakistan has developed nuclear weapons. So 74 really is seen as this demonstration to the international order of India's equality with the great powers and a deep sign of protest against the NPT. So Ron, I want to kind of zoom out a little bit from the Indian case and just ask you to, to, to sort of talk to us a little bit about some of the broader implications of your study, right? I mean, you note towards the end of the book that, look, I mean, one of the things, one of the lessons that you can glean from these, these cases is that rising powers can, in fact, be restrained, right? There's nothing prefixed, you know, preordained about their challenging or upsetting the established order. Um, so if we kind of come back to China, which is where we started this conversation, if you're the United States, you know, what might you do to restrain China without necessarily compelling it to overturn the existing liberal international order? This sort of would have been a good question to ask in the 1990s. I, I think we are... <laughs> Too much water under the bridge. Yeah, yeah. I think that, that really the chip is, we're past that time. But, you know, I mean, if you think about the 1990s, you think about the early 2000s, the U.S. is asking China to be a responsible stakeholder in international governance without really giving chi China any recognition or equal billing in, in any of the, what, what that means, responsible stakeholder basically means do what we want you to do, right? And and you can't treat rising powers like that. I mean, you can if you want to, but it's, it's a recipe for failure. And so, um, you know, I think over time, Chinese leaders came to the conclusion that the U.S. would never genuinely offer that equal seat at the table. And, and their efforts at IMF reform and World Bank reform and all these other things went, went to, came to naught. Almost nothing really has happened. Um, and now that things are much more contentious, those options are off the table. But there are other things the U.S. could do. I think there are other rising powers in the system that can be cultivated. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of India and Brazil, who are keen to get into the U.N. Security Council and become permanent veto-wielding members. Um, the U.S. could very well recognize their status claims to, di to dilute China's influence uh, and prestige. Right? And so the challenge, of course, is this also dilutes the U.S.'s own influence and prestige uh, because pre uh, status is a limited, in limited supply. If you give it to everyone, then it means nothing. Right? And so um, it might still be worth doing it, though, to have a more stable and enduring international order, which is to say that if you recognize the status claims of countries like India and Brazil, they might become much greater supporters of the international order as it is today and try to restrain China from, from being too assertive in pushing its own interests. Uh, so that's one thing. And the other is, you know, reforming these institutions that need reform. Um, the, the IMF, the World Bank, and the ADB, as I mentioned, leadership in those institutions. Also, don't the U.S. could do less to sort of try and prevent other countries from joining things like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. When the AIB was announced, the U.S. tried very hard to stop countries from joining it. There's no reason to do that. It's a, it's, it's a much lower stakes organization than existing organizations, right? It has a lower capitalization. It doesn't really threaten the World Bank in any way. It's okay to have China, to have have for China to have a symbolic win or two once in a while. You know, in fact, it helps. Uh, and so because it also alienates fewer third parties who are watching both the U.S. and China as sources of potential instability in this return to the great power competition or Cold War 2.0, whatever you want to call it, right? So I think giving some ground is useful. So, Rohan, can I just kind of push back a little bit on that? I mean, you know, 
uh, the U.S., of course, is on record as saying that they would welcome an expanded U.N. Security Council in which India figures. Um, uh, they have pushed for India to be a member of a group like APEC, which frankly is not necessarily one of the most premier regional organizations. But 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 in both places, right, China has been uh, 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 stubbornly opposed uh, for all the reasons you might imagine. So so in some sense, you know, while China may not feel like it's a, a, an equal member of the club, by virtue of the fact that it is a member of the club, uh, they are stymieing efforts by the U.S. And, and other partners to actually keep India out. I mean, is that a fair assessment of the current situation? That's a great, yeah, that's a great question, great assessment. I think that's absolutely right. And I think that's what really blocks uh, U.N. Security Council expansion. Is It's not, I mean, the, of course, to some extent, it's easy for the U.S. to say these things knowing that it's not going to happen, right? The sort of, uh, international it's a, it's a check they never have to cash, basically. Exactly, right? A, IR Theory 101 tells you that the most diplomatic chatter is cheap talk. You can say it unless you're actually paying costs, right, right to back it up. And the U.S. pays no costs to say that they would love to see India in the Security Council. But I think actually the bigger obstacle is China's objection to Japan joining. And so one of the things that has happened that, that, that caused India's efforts to fail in the past was that India banded together with Germany, Brazil, and Japan in the G4. And I think Japan being in there was a no-no for China. China just absolutely would not countenance that. And so I think there may be other ways to do this. Although now, of course, you know, with the Doklam crisis of 2017 and Ladakh in 2020, I think that ship has also sailed. Uh, so until I think bilateral relations are are better between India and China, I don't think yeah, I don't think this is going to work. Uh, but you know, you know another question that comes to mind, Rohan, and 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 you raise this yourself in the in, in the book is the role of domestic politics, right? So if you think about the Indian case you outlined, you have changes in a country's external position, you know, such as India's approach to nuclear order, that are really elite driven changes, right? These aren't really influenced in a specific sense. I mean, of course, I mean there's a there's a status concern, but 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 these aren't necessarily you know a ballot box issues. But uh, that raises the question, you know, to what extent can domestic politics actually help determine whether or not a country decides to, to elevate their status concerns in global politics, right, in these international institutions, right? Do we have examples of that? Yeah, other people have done good work on this, looking at the domestic politics route through which status concerns play out in policy. And the argument, the, the, the standard cases are always sort of uh, Germany, um, you know, before the First World War and, and before the Second World War, uh, to some extent, uh, and, and actually Japan in the 1930s. And so the argument being that the public actually starts putting pressure on politicians in the sort of semi-democratic setting to, to take action that would actually regain the country's status in some way. But when you're dealing with these domains of high politics and security, there's only so much that public opinion actually does, uh, unless there are clear in politicians who are taking right-wing preferences or nationalist preferences and enacting them on the global stage, uh, you don't necessarily have see that transmission belt between public opinion and, and foreign policy in these cases. So th at least the research that I did shows it's more the case that those who were earlier supporters, so leaders in these rising powers who were earlier supporters of the international order become disillusioned and change their minds about the international order, as opposed to preserving their kind of earlier preferences and being pushed into doing something, right? That's not, not what's happening. They're not, they don't remain supporters of the order and then get pushed by nationalists in a certain direction. They themselves change their minds. And so again, this is the domain of elite politics in a, in a, in a, in a large sense, although public opinion is always helpful to cite and point to, you know, when you're on the international negotiating table and say, look, my hands are tied, the people are angry, you know? Um, so that also, and, and there's good work on, on, on China to show how protests are often instrumentalized for foreign policy objectives. So it's almost the opposite, which is the elites are shaping public opinion rather than the other way around. You know, one of the, the big questions your study raises, and maybe this is a, a, a good place to kind of end the conversation, is, you know, what happens when great powers decide on their own uh, volition to withdraw from the international order that they themselves had a, had a hand in creating, right? And so the obvious example is the one you cite is the United States under Trump, right? Now we're uh, sitting here uh, post the midterm elections in which the Republicans have fared relatively poorly relative to expectations. But I think if, if you talk to any American and you think about 2024, people would say, look, 
there's probably a 50-50 shot that America could return to that position, right, under Trump or, or, or someone else um, once those elections are held. So, you know, if it does, if, if America has uh, a return to Trump or that kind of uh, politician who seeks to have uh, a, a withdrawal of the U.S. from the global stage, right? W- what does that do? You know, if you don't mind speculating, what does that do to the strategies of rising powers like China and India? So we have evidence on that from Trump's first term, right? I mean, although it was a bit of a surprise, countries pretty quickly adjusted to this new American approach of very being very transactional towards the international order, criticizing it as globalist and and undermining American power and giving the upper hand to others and so on. But for me, the the the, the most interesting thing was when the U.S. started pulling back other countries stepped in to fill the void, which to me is the greatest evidence that the order as it is actually has great value for rising powers in other countries, right? If you think about it, Xi Jinping became uh, a great supporter of economic globalization. Narendra Modi became a great supporter of climate change and very active in the in the multilateral domain all around the time that Trump, that the U.S. was pulling out of all of these things. Um, Germany and France, in their public support in those countries for NATO went up after Trump trashed NATO and their contributions. Uh, Japan scrambled to save the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations and converted it into the Comprehensive and Progressive uh, Agreement, TPP, uh, after the U.S. pulled out. So in a way, when the U.S. pulled back, all these countries stepped up to kind of take, take the, uh, take, pick up the slack, as it were. And some of them are doing it because it had great value, and, and, but some of them are also doing it because it gave them a, an opportunity to attain leadership in the international order. And I think I count India and China in that, in that category, India in particular, it dovetailed very nicely with uh, Prime Minister Modi and, and, and uh, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar's approach of making India a leading power, right? Which was announced in 2015. Trump gets elected in 2016. It's a great opportunity uh, for India to start pursuing its leadership. And since then, we've seen this rhetoric from India coming along. They say they want reform multilateralism, but at the same, in the same breath, they often say this also involves shouldering global responsibilities, right? That is India signaling that it is willing to become a leader in the international order if there is space available to India, right? Now, whether that space happens from this in, inadvertent withdrawal because of domestic politics or whether it happens because of a result of a foreign policy decision, that's a different question. But I do think that this we can see a repeat of that or we will see a repeat of that if Trump comes back in 2024. My guest on the show this week is the political scientist Rohan Mukherjee. He's an assistant professor of international relations at LSE. His new book is called Ascending Order, Rising Powers and the Politics of Status in International Institutions. Here's what Anne-Marie Slaughter, the CEO of New America, had to say about it. Ascending Order makes a real contribution to the literature on great power politics and the ways in which we can use institutions to shape the behavior of rising nations. Mukherjee's analysis is clear and compelling readily accessible for both scholars and practitioners. Um, Rohan, I agree with all of that praise. Congrats on the book and thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much, man. It was a pleasure. Grant Masha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you download your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review to help others find the show. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Cliff Jayapranada is our executive producer. Production assistance comes from Nithya Love. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production, brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.